Global Board of Trustees and Washington DC board member uh, for Dai. So uh, thanks for joining. And I am by way of my introduction, I'm an entrepreneur, been working in the field of environment for the last 30 years. And that's what I do is environmental consulting to the various government agencies. Um, and with that, I would like to um, welcome you all to this, this forum where we are um, going to talk about, uh, you're going to hear from, uh, I mean, as you're seeing on the poster here, the, the two very, very famous people from India who are, have done a lot of work in um, social entrepreneurship and very successful enterprises that we are going to introduce, as well as introduce um, the impact investment uh, perspective. And our moderators are Ganesh and Jayesh, who I'll introduce in a bit. You want to change the slide, um, the next one, to, to show you who we are. So I just want, want to first, um, a few things for everybody to housekeeping rules. All attendees should be on mute. Um, and, and all of you should use the, the Q&A option to pose questions to speakers. So not, do not go to the chat option if you wanna ask a question, since it gets mixed up with the chat, please use the question and answer, the Q&A portion. Um, the questions will be taken up by our moderators if they're relevant and, uh, and the time is given, if we have enough time. But if we don't have enough time, we'll get to the questions at the end. Um, should, you, should you have any trouble with the audio, please check your internet connection uh, or um, seek the help from your host. And um, it's advised that other video conferencing tools should be turned off. Um, the next one, I wanna just show you this slide about who we are, uh, just so that a, a one quick thing about our own um, special interest group. Do you wanna move the slide to the next one, Mohini? Um, so the Thai Social Entrepreneurship SIG was just formed this year. So there are special interest groups in, in Thai Global. This is um, the group that just formed this year, early this year. And it is focused on uh, social entrepreneurship and associated impact investing. The idea is to provide a platform. It's our mission to provide a platform to showcase various social enterprises introduce impact investing and bring in thought leaders to share their wisdom. And to, to do that, uh, to continue our activities under that, one of the things we do is this uh, forum every month in which we showcase certain uh, to talk about and also bring the perspective of the, of the impact investment. And so, the, so for this forum, uh, oh, before I go to the forum, the, this is our, the committee, the Social Entrepreneurship Executive Committee for our SIG. Um, I am Smita Sedanti on the left here, uh, the, the global trustee, I just introduced myself. Uh, Dr. Ganesh Natarajan, who's going to be speaking, who is going to be the chair, one of the facilitators here, um, moderators of the first session here. Uh, he's the founder and chairman uh, of 5F World and Pune City Connect. He's also the former CEO of Aptec Zensor Technologies. And Sanjay Karaveru is the founder and president uh, of Action in, for India. He's a co-founder for 3i Partners. He's in Hyderabad. And by the way, Ganesh comes to you from Pune. Uh, and then Vivek Verma, who's a board member of Thai Hyderabad. He's a senior advisor of Telangana State Education Cell and founder of Upsurge Global. Um, Avishay Gupta, who's the investment director, uh, is, is of Caspian and a trustee of Dwara Trust. Jayesh Prakash, who comes to us from Singapore, who is also going to be the first moderator of this session, uh, is a, is a co-founder of Sony Entertainment Television, angel investor and author of this book called What Do I Do With Too Much Money? Or something like that. Jayesh will tell you about the title of his interesting book and also on the advisory board of Akan Jyoti Ayo Hospital, which we will hear about in our next forum. So with that, um, I would let Ganesh take, take it from here and hope you all enjoy it and ask a lot of questions. Thank you. Ganesh. Thank you, Sita. 
Yeah, thank you, Smita, and good evening to all of you in the US, and of course, good morning to everybody in Asia. And if you're coming in from Europe, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. So it's a privilege for me to actually moderate this session because uh, as Smita mentioned, I mean, after the corporate sector, I'm now primarily a investor in digital and also do a lot of work in the social sector. And in the last couple of years, we've been really looking around to see what are those big examples of scale in the social sector. As most of you know, there are I mean, almost millions of not-for-profits not, not as well as small social impact organizations in India. And where we come from, I think India needs the kind of scale that only a few companies have done. And we're going to discuss two stories today. One is a story of tremendous scale. I mean, I'm a great fan of Safina, and I'm delighted she could join us today. And then a story which is really beginning to be very, very important, which is Sujay, and we'll hear it directly from both of them. But just a few thoughts on why we've done it this way. We really believe there is a place in the world for nonprofits or NGOs, if you will, and for social enterprises, which are out to make some money to sustain themselves. So we'll hear from both. And if you look at the nonprofits, I think you've all heard of Akshay Patra. We've all heard of uh, Goonj from by Anshu. And I myself have founded something called Pune City Connect. We have Rani Skruwala's Swadesh Foundation. And all of us are scaling in different parts of the country, in different spheres of social activity. But probably one of the best so stories which you'll hear today is Safina's. And when she started Educate Girls, I think people would have wondered what is it that we are trying to do with, with girls in, in the rural parts of the country, which as you know, is probably one of the most significant areas to focus on. And Safina has done magic. So without unveiling her secrets, over to you, Safina. Please tell us what was the motivation, what are you doing today, and what's the future for Educate Girls? Thank you so much, Ganesh, uh, for your wonderfully kind words. Um, I, yeah, I love talking about the journey of Educate Girls. I founded it 12 years ago. And uh, really, the, the thought behind it, it, it was an extension of my own personal journey. I had had a very difficult childhood. I grew up in an immense amount of poverty, uh, violence, abuse. And then uh, circumstances changed magically. And I also became one of the first people in my family to go internationally, to go overseas for education. I had the opportunity to go to London School of Economics and that totally changed my life. And that really is the seed, the kernel on which this particular organization was founded. Um, but in the 12 years, it has grown from a small 50 school project to currently we're working across 18,000 villages. We have 1,700 full-time employees and almost uh, 13 to 14,000 community workers who are our grassroots volunteers we call Teen Balika. Um, and, uh, you know, in, the, in, in this uh, decade-long uh, journey, we have actually been able to bring back over 750,000 out-of-school girl back uh, into school and improve learning outcomes for about 1.3 million children in very, very rural, remote, and, and tribal uh, geographies. So first and foremost, the thing that I always like to remind people is why girls' education. Yes, it was my own personal journey. It was what transformed my life and, and gives me a voice, really. However, even beyond the, the personal is that the World Bank says that girls' education is one of the best investments that a country can make. It helps you to improve nine of the 17 sustainable development goals. Anything you want to improve, health, education, employability, you want to tackle malnutrition, domestic fire, you name the issue and you can improve it by investing and educating our girls. Um, recently, you know, climate scientists came out with the, with the drawdown, um, project drawdown, which listed 80 actions that the world could adopt to uh, reduce global warming and, and fight climate change. And girls education was at number six. At number six, it was rated higher than solar panels and electric cars. So it is it is truly a transformative proposition. And not just that, I feel like it is the battle of our lifetimes because an educated mother is 200% likely to educate her children. So we just have to do it for her. We have to do it in our generation. And then she will take care of it beyond that. And it really is truly one of the opportunities that we have to solve the, the sort of poverty and illiteracy gap you know, in our country forever. And it is important in our country. Uh, India has the third largest number of out-of-school girls anywhere on the planet. We still have 
over 4 million girls that are not in school. And at the root cause of this, people ask me like, you know, what is it and, and stuff. And I, I like to describe the root cause simply. I mean, the social issues are very complex, uh, totally understand. But at, at the bedrock of it are what I call the two Ps of poverty and patriarchy. And wherever these two Ps combine, you have an exponential growth of out of school girls. And it's essentially, you're mixing um, you know, poverty with social marginalization, essentially. That's what, you know. Um, and, and, and that leads to very, very, very high, exponentially, like I said, high numbers of out of school children, wherever these two Ps um, are actually coming together. And so if that, if we know the root cause, then what is it that Educate Girls does? very quickly we sort of identify the areas which have these explosive hotspots right and then we go door to door in those villages we saturate them completely we knock on every single door in the village to find every single out of school girl uh, in the last few years we have knocked on almost four million households like it's insane the scale of of the thing we do just to identify and i find i find that that's really key to knowing who these girls are and where they are to doing anything beyond that. And once we know, and we use a smartphone, we have our own app, the data comes to us in real time. It, you know, every village, every household now is geotagged. So you can actually build that level of intelligence very quickly to be able to understand the, the spread, the clustering of how the out of school girls are and how they interact with other factors. Um, and once we know that, we actually find a community uh, level person. We call them Team Balika. They're young, educated, passionate individuals. Um, and, and we train them, we handhold them. It's a very high touch model to not just find the girls, but then do village meetings, neighborhood meetings, whatever it takes to convince parents, mohallas, communities, villages to bring these girls back into school. And once they're back in school, we invest in their learning. We run a supplementary learning program in Hindi, English and math, life skills, infrastructure, everything that is going to make that government school girl friendly and make sure that she's in school, staying in school and learning. Um, and, and this is kind of, you know, uh, our basic model. When I started, I started at 50 schools and I grew to 500 schools and very quickly, in just the first initial years, we had hit about 5,000 uh, schools. And I used to really worry, I used to worry. And I was like, am I just replicating in more and more villages or is there a value add? And that kept me up so much at night that that became really the genesis of the world's first development impact bond in education. Because I wanted to make sure, and development impact bond was essentially a, a payment by results contract. It had an outcome pay, it had, a, it had an investor, it had you know, a, a service provider, that was us, uh, and it had a third party evaluator. And really, the, and everybody thought that I did it because it was a fundraising tool or something like that, because it is an innovative financing mechanism. However, I did it because I wanted to solve this problem saying, how do you scale, but you scale quality? And if you get paid only on results, then you're forced to build an organization that has delivery of quality at scale in its DNA. Uh, and so that was a three-year transaction. We did it in Bhilwada in Rajasthan. And... Um, um, the results that came from the third party evaluator at the end of the three years showed that Educate Girls um, enrolled 92% of all out of school girls. And our, we actually achieved about 160% of our learning targets, which meant that the average child got an additional year of schooling and all delivered through a community ownership model. You know, it was all delivered through a village level uh, team balika. So it's a sustainable model, it's smart, it's scalable. It is, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't create a parallel delivery system. It is still strengthening the government's own right to education. It's built on that policy. So we kind of knew that we had something special. Um, so we took a little bit of time to reflect, like, what are the, the core elements of our scale? And, and obviously, you know, a lot of it is just having a very clean and clear vision of success. I think if you ask me, or if you ask the team Balik on the ground, who we are, what we do, and what is our vision of success, you would get exactly the same answer. Um, the second is I think we have a highly codified model. It's really, it's modular, it stacks up, and, it, and that allows us to be very decentralized um, and give a lot of um, room for people on the ground to actually do what needs to be done for their particular village. 
uh, because overall the model is very codified, so they can they can kind of play with it a lot easier. Um, Ninety nine percent of our teams come from the same villages, so it is a locally owned and built model from the ground. I have men who are leading my districts right now who themselves were married off in the third grade or the fourth grade. So this is an issue that comes straight to them. They know what it feels like to be a child bride, or they know what it feels like to not have agency when you're just in the third grade and your future decided for you. So having that kind of mission-driven teams, and I always, you know, we always hire for the values and the mission, connect to the mission first, and then we build the skills for whoever we, we bring on board. Community, uh, you know, completely community owned and heavy use of data and technology. Very, very heavy use. I mean, uh, we've been, you know, doing a lot of the geotagging, et cetera, from a long time ago. Uh, smartphones were there for every field worker, et cetera. Um, and then also like Ganesh is on our board, but he will, he will also tell you like, we have an insanely amazing board, very, very um, strong governance. Um, but also we work in five year cycles so that we make like long-term five-year plans. We're able to invest heavily in its growth and its scale. So the scale is kind of very designed uh, from the board uh, that, that kind of is coming through. Um, and that allows us to really kind of grow into our skin and not, you know, overheat. Um, and and five-year planning ensures that we're not just parachuting into a, a rural village and parachuting out and doing one-year projects. We're actually there for the long haul. Um, some of the districts where I started, those girls are now passing the 10th grade. So it's really, and education is a long-term game. You can't you know, do one-year projects and two-year projects. So really given all of this, the key insight that we came up with because we had such amazing data and we were using machine learning already, is that we wanted to build ourselves a really big audacious vision. And uh, India has 650,000 villages, but we've realized that 40% of out-of-school girls in India are actually in just 5% of the villages. And through predictive analytics, we're actually able to identify exactly which are these you know, 35,000 villages. And our goal, our big audacious goal in the next five years by 2023, 24, is to saturate these 5% of the villages and solve 40% of the problem of out of school girls in India, uh, which would mean that we would bring back about 1.5 million girls who are currently at home looking after siblings, grazing the cattle, you know, doing all the household work, getting married early, that they would all be in school and they would be studying and they will, they will stay and complete their education. And we know that if we do that, it will just it'll be the biggest nation building thing we could do because it will trigger such a massive multiplier effect around malnutrition, immunization. Immunizations go up by 40% if girls are educated. Like, you know, every single thing. And we can set off this massive virtuous cycle to help us, um, you know, reach the sustainable development goals. But more than anything, I feel like it's imperative we do it because at the end of the day, it's her right. So with that, I'll end. I am Safina Hossein and I educate girls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Safina. Always a pleasure to listen to you. And, uh, and what you said about the team, in fact, whenever I talk to people in Safina's team, I mean, you can have a conversation on artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is probably more intricate and more complicated than you have in Silicon Valley. So clearly, there's a lot you're doing right in terms of not being just one more social enterprise. So with that, I think we'll move on to Sujay. Sujay, tell us your story and let's let's understand what you're doing and what your ambitions are. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Ganesh. Thank you, Jaisbhai, for giving us the opportunity to uh, share a story. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, depending on wherever you are. So I am Sujay Santa, founder CEO at ITR. Uh, prior to starting ITR, I have worked in IBM and Oracle, uh, last in Oracle as a solution architect, so typically around 12 years in the IT field uh, on civil CRM, Hyperion, profit logic, and uh, I've uh, grown up in uh, uh, in West Bengal. And since my early childhood, I've seen for even for the basic primary healthcare, people had to travel uh, all the way on an average of 20 to 25 kilometers in the villages. And in case of any kind of tertiary care need, most of them had to travel all the way down to South India or Mumbai or uh, Chennai. And uh, in many such incidences, we have seen that uh, any such incident uh, wherein they had to pay uh, for the hospitalization, the entire family has been pushed down back to the poverty. 
uh, in my personal incidences, like how I got from a tech techie to a healthcare uh, without any knowledge in the healthcare, we have seen technology playing a key role uh, in many areas. My first mentor was actually Professor K. Radhakrishnan, uh, the mission to Mars uh, while I was working as a junior scientist in NRSA. And we have seen technology playing a key role in many areas, but unfortunately not within the healthcare space. Within the healthcare, most of the technologies has been built around the businesses, meaning that when a patient is walking to a hospital, all the patient registration billing happens. And when a patient is walking out to the hospital, the patient loses all contact with the doctors. And that was the whole premise to start iCure, that how we would be able to build a solution which is centered around the patient, which matters the most within the healthcare space. And uh, that's how iCure was born. Initially, we were a pure technology company. We started in 2010. And the public healthcare has been kind of a black box. Uh, even actually, it's a black box till now, wherein you really don't know what's happening beyond district uh, tier one or metro cities. Uh, so here we were trying to work with corporates, governments, NGOs, and others. And we thought that maybe uh, initially it was three, four years, we were a pure tech pair. And uh, we kind of felt that unless and until you get down on the ground, you will not be able to create the right kind of impact and you know engage on a vision. So what was our vision? Our vision is that no patient should die due to unavailability of doctors. Uh, that's, uh, that's our vision. And then in 2014-15, uh, we started with our own primary healthcare delivery with the whole objective of if a patient wants to come to a, a primary healthcare clinic, they should be able to get all the services. Typically, if a patient has to go to a primary healthcare facility, such as a government facility, which is on an average of 15 to 20 kilometers, uh, they might be able to see a doctor. In many cases, medicines are not available. So they have to go for additional five or seven kilometers to buy medicines at an MRP. And so that actually goes for the entire half a day or more than that, which is the loss of wage for that uh, patient or their family members. So here at iCure, which we have created through different experimentation models, that how we would be able to create a structure. As we know that in India, we have a huge demand in the supply gap with, the, with regards to doctors and the patients. For every 2,000 odd patients, we just have only one doctor. So how we would be able to create a solution? So we have built a, what we call as a hub and spoke model. Hub is like a rented facility, where, which is a, anywhere between 600 to 1,000 or 1,500 square feet of space, wherein we have physical doctors, medicines, uh, various pathology tests being done. So the patients can come in five and a half days in a week. We have also gone deeper into the pockets, which we call as touch points. So you convert anything like school building, farmers clubs, in, in as these touch points or the spokes, wherein the patients from surrounding areas, they come, they get access to physical doctors, computers, eye checkup, medicines, blood collections. If they need advanced specialist consultation, they can go to the hub, which is at a maximum distance of 15 to 20 kilometers. Then we also identified the frontline community health workers. For us, the other uh, way of doing it was, can we engage you know, college interns to go deeper into the pockets? But we did not do that. We actually trained the village women or maybe the self-help groups who, uh, who have been trained on uh, you know, how to use smartphone loaded with our application and medic bags. So when they are going to a pregnant mother's doorstep, and this doorstep could be at the last mile across the hills, through the jungles or across the river without any bridges, we give digital health cards to the pregnant mothers. When they are scanning that card through the app, automatically all the data shows up onto the application. When they're measuring the vitals, it could be temperature, it could be hemoglobin, it could be other things onto the application. Automatically, it will tell whether the patient is within the normal range or whether there are any risk indicators or not. And all this is happening in an offline as well, even where there is no internet or electricity. So in a three-layered architecture, we have created a collaborative ecosystem, right from the frontline health workers going to the post doorstep, to the spoke or the touch points, to our hubs, we have built this model. So now uh, over this period, we have built 10 hubs, 160 touch points. We have treated 1.1 million patients uh, covering uh, across 10.2 million population in seven states in India. So apart from our hubs, we also run several programmatic interventions with different partners. So for example, with Desh Pandey Foundation, we tried to work on, can we create a model uh, to identify the high risk indicators for the patients and help them in institutionalized birth rate, 100% institution uh, delivery at the hospitals. Uh, so we have been also working with University of Michigan on a research intervention. 
So where do we go from here and what is our objective? How are we actually earning our revenues? So our revenues comes from three sources. One, from the patients who are paying for the doctor consultation, medicine, spectacles, you know, sanitary pads, and many other things. We also create livelihood opportunity for the frontline health workers because they earn a, a you know, fixed income on top of that. There are several incentives. Apart from that, we also engage with the self-help groups. Uh, then we also engage with several corporates. During the pandemic, we have seen many patients have been, uh, you know, the most of the focus has been on the COVID patients. And that has left a lot of patients suffering from hypertension, diabetic, cardiac patients, pregnant mothers, infants who were not able to reach out to the doctors, who are not able to get medicines. So we have something called this aided telemedicine platform. So using our technology, frontline health workers are going to the patient's doorstep, capturing the vitals, entering the data, initiating the call with the doctors and engaging in a much more meaningful teleconsultation. So the patients are able to speak, the health workers are able to capture the vitals, they are able to communicate with the doctors. And this is how we have been able to uh, work uh, during this entire COVID period. As the unlock st has started, we have been also screening a lot, lot of corporates who are opening up the industries, factories for the COVID screening programs. So we work with Tata Metal Lakes, uh, Hindustan Petroleum, Indian Oil, Credit, the real estate developers for the construction health worker screening. Uh, so our mission is that we don't want to set up hubs all over the place. We want to work with governments at the state level, at the central level, we want to work with, uh, we have been creating a collaborative ecosystem because public healthcare has been working like a silo. The medical pharma companies, device companies, research organizations don't interact and integrate with each other. So at IQR, we are working with the ground partners because they have already built a trust factor within the community. We are working with several research partners like MIT, University of Michigan, Stanford, McGill. We are working with different device companies to integrate the devices, as well as we are working with international uh, collaborators. Recently, we have backed the contract for the entire state of Nagaland, uh, and we are providing the telehealth solution across 194 primary healthcare facilities and sub-centers uh, in Nagaland. And this has been officially launched on 9th of September. So within just 25 days, we scaled our solution across 82 centers. And by end of November, we would be able to roll out to the entire state. Now, how did we win that when we had many other players in this space? Uh, we won that because we have the ability to understand what all it takes to integrate devices, technology on the ground beyond Pier 1 and Metro Cities. Unlike a pure tech player who do not have much understanding what really happens beyond you know, metros and cities, iCare is one of the players which is able to integrate such solutions. Similarly, we have backed another contract from Japan Industrial Corporation Agency to roll out in another state. And how we wish to, we want to scale up to across 200 uh, clinics in the next three to four years, covering 50 million population. Apart from that, IKR also intends to work with different state and central governments. Recently, you have seen Prime Minister Mr. Modi announced the National Digital Health Mission and the India Health Stack. So that means uh, India would be going through a sea change as, with regards to the health tech solutions, patient data privacy. So iCure is working with Microsoft Research Labs to create a data privacy framework. iCure has been also working with uh, IBM Watson Labs uh, creating on AI and ML solution. So last year we presented at the HIMSS conference in Orlando that can we capture the data for the cardiac patients, monitor the data on an AI ML solution and see that which are the patients which are at higher risk and those cases could be present to a cardiologist first. So this has been successful as a pilot model. It has been showcased across in US and in front of various state governments. And now we are looking to see that how we would be able to integrate such devices. This COVID era has also you know, taught us many things. There would be a sea change with regards to the patient's behavior going forward. More and more patients are going to shy away, going to the hospitals for the just OPD checkups. With the emergence of a lot of devices, technologies, more and more patients are looking to get services right at the doorstep or closer to the community. And that is where the iCure's power of integrating devices, technology, providing continuum of care right at the patient's doorstep or for the patients for going to the hospitals or when the patients are coming back uh, to the villages, they would be able to do that. And uh, during our journey, we have been very lucky to get uh, the support of our investors. Uh, we have Jayes Bhai, who have been the early believers in iCure. He has mentored us throughout our journey. Uh, we have raised investments uh, from various angel and institutional groups across US, India, and Japan. And recently, 
we have got the support from Mr. Ratan Tata during our uh, as an investor. Uh, so Mr. Tata mentioned uh, during a conversation that he has been looking for such kind of a model in his uh, in his mind as well. So that gives that uh, you know definitely a strong fillip to the core sector which needs focus not only just for aggregators or integrators. So here at iCare we have been able to create a sustainable profitable model with regards to primary healthcare integration of technology and how you would be able to build collaborative ecosystem so that no patients would die due to unavailability of doctors thank you thank you very much sujay that was really wonderful and uh, i think we have exactly 3 minutes left in this part of the session so let me just ask my favorite question to safina so safina i think i mean when we look at any successful model it doesn't matter whether it's for profit not for profit social corporate i mean even the investing we do it's all about does the entrepreneur have a great point of view have you thought through your business model and you know incorporated technology etc cetera, etc cetera? i think both of you have done that phenomenally well and then of course i think we have do we have a successful team and a board which can really help us to scale and finally funding so you mentioned development impact bonds so i mean can you just maybe take a minute and tell us what is your view a lot of entrepreneurs who listen to you what would you advise them in terms of scaling and how do they go around thinking about funding looking for funding and getting funding yeah <laughs> funding you know it's uh, it's the fuel that actually makes all of this happen so i think funding is really key i i definitely have a few views about funding uh, and it doesn't matter if it's coming the instruments can be you know it can be csr or retail or whatever whatever um or through a bond uh, which is an investment but i think the thing to think about uh, and this at least it's for me and it works for me is that that funding must be aligned to your strategic goal your vision and your mission it's kind of otherwise there are lots of downstream problems you know a lot of the times um, social under, we because we are so hungry for money because we have salaries to pay and all the rest of it sometimes we accept money and then we end up making projects for that money so to constantly res resist that and we've had to say no to a lot of money because it didn't completely align with our mission um but i think be strategic build the strategic plan that should be and then the money uh, that you raise needs to be aligned to it um but yeah i think i think it's the strategy and the board <laughs> whipping you into shape on that strategy comes really on on top Thanks, but I have to say, Ganesh, if I if I may, just one little yeah. thing. I yeah. think yeah. I think uh, apart from the talent and the team and the board and all the rest of it, I think the biggest bottleneck to scale is the founder. Um, and truly, and and so I was very lucky that my donors didn't just give me money, but they they got me coaching. Like you know, I've had professional coaches for years and years and years to kind of help me because I would otherwise I would probably be the biggest. person to sabotage uh, the organization so i think i think uh, coaching for founders is the other thing that donors should really seriously seriously think about because we are the biggest bottleneck uh, many a time oh no you just broke my bubble i thought i was going to ask you whether you <laughs> to coach everybody else <laughs> <laughs> so jay last 30 seconds for you uh, how are you building a team to make this huge scale i mean we all know the healthcare problem so it can't be one sujay santra so how do we replicate you in 100 places Yeah, thanks. A great question, Ganesh. So we have built a very strong leadership team. So apart from me, we have Rahul Chatterjee, who brings in more than twenty-five years' experience, uh, having led in the health tech across Siemens and Atos. No, apart uh, from your corporate, no, when you when you go to Nagaland, when you go to different parts of the country, that's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? So how do you find leaders in various remote parts of the country? Yeah, uh, Nagaland has been a pretty good example. So what one thing that has happened really uh, is we were looking for a project manager in Nagaland. as well as the assistant project manager in nagaland and that we covid time when the travel was not allowed uh, and uh, we were lucky to because of our network on the ground our reach by the with the ngos i am being an ashoka fellow uh, who has a lot of fellows all across in india and across 82 countries uh, globally uh, so we have built a good network wherein people already know about our work uh they are they have a good respect uh, so you know getting a good talent who is inspirational who is passionate who is not like looking at only a 10 to 5 kind of a thing uh we are happy to uh, get resources uh, quickly uh yeah so on that that's absolutely amazing and thank you very much and i'm sure all of you will agree these were two absolutely brilliant entrepreneurs to start this session with and now of course the fuel for everybody is money so let's jayesh bhai who better than jay talk to kartik about money Thank you, Ganesh, and thank you, Safina and Sujay. That was very inspiring. At first, I want to thank uh, the Thai uh, global team, Vijay Venan and Mohini Sochanti, 
I'm a proud, I'm proud to be part of the uh, committee of Thai Special Interest Group on Social Entrepreneurship. And I want to thank the committee members, Mita, Sanjay, Vivek, Avishek, and uh, Ganesh. And thanks to everyone who joined today. My name is Jayesh Parekh. I am based in Singapore. I'm a diehard Thai charter member. I'm an invited board of trustee for Thai Mumbai, and I'm on the committee of Thai Singapore. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Sony Entertainment Television. Briefly, uh, Smita had introduced me. I'm also on the advisory board of Akhanjyoti Eye Hospital, which is a nonprofit in Bihar. I'm on the investment committee of uh, Avishkar Social Impact Venture Funds. Uh, last year, I published a book titled, What Shall We Do With All This Money? Inspiring Perspectives on Wealth. And what I'm most excited about now is a new venture capital fund that I'm starting with Gautam Godwani uh, in Singapore for alternative protein startups. So. Uh, Going forward, I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed speaker, uh, Karthik Desai. Karthik is someone I've known personally and seen evolve into a leader in the impact investing space. He uh, grew up in New York, uh, attended Wharton and Columbia, and worked as an investment banker for DSP Merrill Lynch before jumping headlong into impact investing, impact investing space in early 2006, first with Lok Capital, then Avishkar, two of the pioneers uh, of this space where he made investments in MFIs and MFIs and social enterprises in India and uh, across South Asia. Uh, in 2014, Vikram Gandhi and Pramod Bhasin asked Karthik to set up and lead uh, Asha Impact, uh, which is a combination of an investment platform for some of India's leading family offices and business leaders and a think tank to share the lessons of uh, impact investments with government and build the market in new areas like impact bonds. Uh, Asha Impact has uh, made several notable investments across sectors, including two recent exits, which I'm sure Karthik will speak about. And uh, taken, he's taken a leadership position, a role in the industry association, IIC, which is called Impact Investors Council, where Karthik serves on the board to help evangelize and build the industry with folks such as uh, yourselves. So uh, Karthik, welcome. I will uh, briefly just uh, make, you know, introduce Impact Investing Basically, impact investing, uh, most of you know, but I just uh, sort of level set, it's a collision between financial returns and social impact. And it is commonly known as a double bottom line investment, right? And uh, some investors who are more mission driven are called impact first investors. And the ones that are primarily focused on economic returns are called finance first impact investors. And you can, it, it, impact investment spans uh, across a number of industries, including healthcare, health tech, edu tech, education, energy, especially clean and renewable energy, agriculture and agri-tech agri and many other verticals. So Karthik, let's launch into it. I just want to have you give us uh, your introduction to impact investing. And also if you can highlight some of the differences between mainstream technology VC and uh, impact VC. Sure, uh, thank you, Jayesh Bhai. Thank you, Ganesh, uh, and thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here, uh, an, an honor actually. Uh, so I'll just jump right into it. Uh, I think impact investing, uh, building upon what Jayesh Pai said, can be impact first, or it can be finance first, or there's people like us who want to have their cake and eat it too. So we say it's, it's both. It delivers market returns and it uh, delivers impact. But in one sentence, I think, because many people are confused by this word, sometimes it's ambiguous. And the reason it's ambiguous is because it involves both finance, so elements of ESG and SRI, and sometimes elements of philanthropy. But in one sentence, I think what impact investing is basically to profitably deliver a product and service to an underserved segment. So it has something to do with delivering a product or service to do so sustainably. The question is how sustainably? Moderate profits or market level profits? And of course, to people who don't have it, uh, right? So, uh, you know, the definition involves something around intent, something around exclusion, something around a market-based approach. But basically, it's about the criticality of unlocking private capital for development. And the reason this is important is, of course, because we need $500 billion per year just for India of private capital to meet our SDGs. But there's a huge opportunity, right? India has 3 million NGOs and 50,000 startups, of which many are socially inclined. So this industry um, has shaped up decently well on the back of microfinance. Just put some stats out there. As the Impact Investors Council, the Industry Association defines it, 11 billion US dollars with a B has flown in over the last 10 years. It's actually a very small amount of money, 1 billion per year from 2010 to 2019. 
across some 586 enterprises. Average deal size is about 10 million, which means that the bigger companies have done follow-ons, but right in total is about 550 enterprises across broadly five sectors. Financial services is about half of it. And then there's the big three, which is education, healthcare, and ag, agriculture, which typically are the three big social sectors. And then there's a fourth, sorry, fifth catch-all sector called technology for development, which would be of most interest to commercial and tech-oriented VCs and angels like Mintai. And this doesn't include, of course, other sectors like housing, waste, livelihoods, and all, which are smaller. So this is a little bit of the landscape of the, 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 the land. Uh, in terms of the range of investors, as Jayesh Bhai uh, alluded to, there's a many uh, family offices and HNIs uh, who are starting to get into it and commercial investors. But honestly, most impact funds, and there's about 40 plus in India today, when uh, those of us who have been working in the industry for a while, and those of us who have been there for decades, like Jayesh Bhai, there were just one or two, uh, now there's 40. But it's still mostly DFI capital. So there's a clear need for more commercial capital, more private capital. Uh, and finally, to your point, uh, Jayesh Bhai, on the distinction between tech VC and impact VC, it's a very good question because it's starting to overlap. If you look at the data, these 586 companies and this $11 billion that I quoted from the industry study, and I can share the link in the comments, almost half of that capital is commercial capital, right? We define this as an impact enterprise, like Educate Girls is an impact uh, enterprise, IQ is an impact enterprise, whoever invests in that. So if Asha Impact invests in that, it's considered an impact investment. But if InfoEdge or Sequoia Capital invests, it's not. So it's kind of half and half. So every dollar of impact capital has unlocked that much commercial capital. And now there's a big overlap. You see success stories. Recently in the press, many of you would have read about Vedantu, Unacademy, White Hat, large companies, EdTechs, raising tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So there are segments in this broad area known as tech for dev, things like utilitarian products for the poor, social commerce, future of work for gig economy workers, SME tech, media and vernacular content. So these are areas where you have overlap. Uh, and the final point I'll make is, you know, the crux of this and whether you're a tech VC or an impact VC, what you're really looking for, you know, Ganesh is talking about bringing capital and it's about impact oriented capital, but it's capital plus innovation. It's capital to see business model innovation for the masses. And of course, there's three types of innovation, product innovation, process innovation, or tech innovation. So as long as someone is, and I can give examples of each. So, you know, affordable housing or, uh, is an example of product innovation, a house for the poor at a certain price or distributed re renewable energy, a mini grid for a village. Process innovation is like microfinance or waste management. How do you do something more efficiently so that poor can access it at lower cost? And proper tech innovation would be like precision ag or med tech, ed tech, fintech. So it's really like applying capital towards that innovation to get disruptive growth and value creation. It just happens to be focusing on the mass market. That's how I look at impact investing. Sorry for no, the thank you. No, no, th thank you so much. I think that's good. It's a good uh, base uh, platform here. Can we request you to now uh, give us a couple of examples, right? I mean, we, we keep hearing about this impact investing and in startups and maybe one example of early stage and maybe one of growth stage. Sure. So Asha Impact uh, is a sector agnostic invest investor. We have been around for about five, six years. Uh, we have looked at these five, six broad social sectors, right? And just to add, we look at financial services as a horizontal, right? So 50% of the activity in impact investing is in FS. And for whether for better or worse, a lot of the exits are there, a lot of the returns are there. So those of us who are commercially inclined investors have to generate returns. We tend to look at FS as like half of our universe. And what I mean by that is you can have agri lending, you can have healthcare lending, you can have education lending, housing lending. So you see, so FS applies to every single sector. And then you have the sectors, education, healthcare, agriculture. And then you can focus where in the sector do you want to play? What segments do you like? Is it early education? Is it late? What business models are suitable for equity investing versus for philanthropy? So that with that framework, uh, and look, certain sectors are more developed like FS because there's a market infrastructure. So there'll be more growth stage opportunities, higher returns. Other sectors are less developed. So if you're investing in, let's say, ag, there's a lot of industry challenges that you face. So the investments there will tend to be earlier stage. So to quickly jump into two examples, I'll talk about an example in early stage investing in, in this very interesting and difficult space. And this beautiful background we see behind the JSPI 
in agriculture, right? Uh, and it's a company called Gramophone. It's, uh, it's, it's an agri input distribution company. Okay, this is an interesting space in India. Think about it as e-commerce for farmers. You have two other companies in this space. You've got a company called AgroStar, you've got a company called Deha, and we've got this company called Gramophone. Asha Impact and InfoEdge. This is the, you know, the IT company which owns Nokri, Zomato, so on and so forth. One of it, if India's leading IT internet company and us are the co-investors. Again, it shows you, Jayesh, by that tech investors and impact investors can work together. So what does Gramophone do? Simple. It helps small holder, last mile farmers in villages access quality and affordably priced agri inputs. What are agri inputs? Seeds, fertilizers, crop protection, crop nutrition implements, and so on and so forth. Right now, the farmer has to go to a store and buy it. He may not get the right products. He may not get it at the right price. So this is agronomy-led agri inputs. It's not just an app. It's, it's the right information at the right time, and the farmer can get it from the app or from a customer service rep. So just to give an example, imagine you are a farmer and your crop is having some infection or something, right? So now you can take a photograph from your mobile phone of the leaf with a little purple fungus on it and upload it and the customer rep will call you. And he'll say, okay, he knows your local conditions. He knows your crop. He'll suggest you the right chemicals. So you get it. So you're not just getting it at a lower price, but you're getting the right product delivered to your doorstep. Your yield will go up. Amazing company, right? Has been scaling up from like one crore of revenue to like 40 CR, uh, 40 crore Indian rupees run rate currently working with over 100,000 farmers just in two or three districts in Madhya Pradesh. So going deep into MP before expanding out. This company is scaling well and, uh, and so are the others in this segment. So here's an example of a deep impact, right? And including in COVID times. Here's a company which during lockdown is scaling up because it's providing socially distant services to farmers. A growth stage example, again, in a very non sexy sector, which people don't typically associate with venture capital, waste management. And this is a company called Nepra Resource Management or Nepra. Okay, it's a company based in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, funded by Asha Impact and Avishkar. Avishkar is probably the largest impact fund in India. JH Pai, of course, is one of the founders of it. Uh, and Nepra is, is, is a pioneer in something so simple, which is to collect, process, and sell dry waste something which is standard in the West, right? Material recycling facilities, a little facility where the waste comes, it gets segregated on these plastic conveyor belts and the plastics are actually very valuable. If with lasers and all of that, you can separate them into different colors, different types of plastic and whatnot. But to do that, you need a supply chain. Now, not all Indians segregate. So Nepra has a system of waste pickers who work to collect segregated waste. Now they're doing this at such incredible scale that they're actually working directly with municipalities, like with the municipality of Indore, which is India's cleanest city. They've got a 300 ton plant in Indore. The total waste of Indore is 500 tons. So that means like more than 50% of the entire waste of the city, the city collects, hands it over to them. They process it, they sell it to recyclers, generate very attractive 20% plus gross margins. And uh, this company you know, has, has got a revenue run rate of almost 100 crores uh, currently. And, uh, and is now expanding to set up facilities in major Indian cities, five, six major cities from Mumbai to Baroda, to Pune, to Jamnagar. And three years ago, it was just in Ahmedabad. So here's an example of a growth stage uh, company. Thank you. And I, just to uh, sort of have full disclosure, I'm not a founder of Avishkar. Thank you so much, uh, Karthik. Uh, Vinit Rai is the founder of Avishkar. I'm on the investment committee of a few of Avishkar's impact funds. Uh, the other uh, parallel example of Gramophone is uh, AgroStar, which Karthik briefly mentioned. It's also an agri-tech company. Just recently, this year, it got a Series C funding of $27 million. And the investors were people like Bertelsmann, Axel, Chirate, and Avishkar. So that just kind of gives you a sense of uh, how this sector is, is sort of brewing. Uh, just right. a quick segue now, uh, Karthik, is uh, what type of issues should impact investors uh, focus on when we are measuring the impact of their investment? Yeah. So this is a key issue and sometimes one which has been brushed under the carpet and what makes impact investing challenging, which is how do you measure the impact, right? Dollar for dollar. Many customized frameworks are there from social return on investment to what have you. So one can have a long discussion on impact measurement, but the crux of it is it has to be simple. It has to be measurable. It has to be global. 
So they ha you have these SDG standards, which are very helpful, sustainable development goals. Every company, every sector, sorry, every country, every sector has its, has its you know, uh, standards. So everything is now reported by SDG. But here's a simple way to think about impact. We call it the three P's, the people, the planet, and purpose. People is how many people are you impacting, but not just the number of people, the depth of impact. That's harder to measure, no? What's the increase in learning levels? And this is where Safina's example of educated girls is so compelling and why impact bonds measure things more tightly, right? So that's the people. Planet. Planet has kind of a consistent metric on carbon, which can be applied across dozens of sectors, not just energy, but mobility, you know, transportation, uh, you know, ag even agriculture, water, waste management, so like net carbon savings, right? And third is purpose, which means that is there impact intentionality? Does the company stay up front that boss, I'm trying to create some impact and this is what it means. I'll try to have low income consumers or whatever. And this can be reflected in the charter documents of a company, right? The articles of association or whatever. And the company reports it, just like we report our annual report every year on our financial metrics. We also report our impact metrics. So these are some of the aspects around impact measurement, but it must be simple, but it's super critical because if we don't do it, then it's hard to substantiate what the impact is. And, and, and this is becoming more of an imperative with the overlap of commercial VC and impact investing. Yeah, so, so talking about commercial, uh, you know, again, uh, I know I realize that you may not be able to give us all the speeds and feeds, but we would really love to learn and hear a little bit about the exits in this space, right? I mean, do they, are there substantial exits and uh, are impact investors making uh, economic returns that are meaningful? Yes, they are. And they're sometimes making greater uh, returns than so-called commercial uh, funds. And the reason for that is simple uh, because the economic model here is a bit more humble, right? The Silicon Valley VC model assumes a 10X return on a success story, right? Here in India, because of capital market efficiency or lack of, an acquirer won't give you that 5X revenue multiple. Your success story will be a 5X. And I'll tell you one or two quick success stories. So your failure rate can't be 80% and ask you 50%. So Impact investors, if you look at frequent data and the rest, have generally tended to outperform other VC funds. That is a fact. Now, it's also a fact that 90% of the exits that impact investors have done have come in financial services, and they've been massive outsized exits in not just microfinance, but SME finance, which, which has generated these amazing returns. Now, in the other sectors like education, healthcare, ag, the returns are yet to come. They're, they're, they're new, but I already gave you three examples of white hat. Look at White Hat, a net tech company which does coding for, for low-income kids. Forget the numbers there, but it's, it's amazing. Asha Impact, we're only a four-year-old VC fund. We've had uh, two exits. Uh, you know, one is a company called Vartana, which is a well-known company which lends to affordable private schools. Uh, our you know, exit there was over a 90% IRR. Uh, we invested early, and then we sold it to a commercial a VCPE fund uh, called Chris Capital. Many, many impact funds have invested in that company and they're all going to generate strong returns. We've also invested in a housing finance company called Vastu. We seeded that company. So we came in at par. That company is going to probably have a, have a large uh, exit uh, soon too. So definitely the proof points are there uh, and there needs to be more proof points. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think this will be very interesting as we sort of follow the trajectory. But uh, in the last few minutes that we have, can you just give us very briefly, some key trends that are shaping uh, the future of impact investing, Karthik? Sure. <clears throat> so I'll touch upon three quick points. One is regulation, right? Uh, we're talk we, we have the social stock exchange that the government of India has announced, which is amazing. Uh, and this applies both to for-profits and not-for-profits. Uh, people are, like us are working on figuring out what those listing criteria and uh, conditions look like. The CSR law, Forget the amount, I think mm, between, I think about $10 billion annually, if not more, depends on how much you know, estimates you take, is available of CSR money, which could go into this area. There's regulatory issues there. Again, those are being worked on. So regulation is a huge driver. The government of India is getting behind this in a big way. And of course, for impact bonds that Safina spoke about, getting the government as outcome funder. Asha Impact is actually working on the first such bond in Pune and Pimpri. And, uh, and you know, we, we can separately talk about that. That's the second trend, blended finance. That impact investing is now really moving to add debt and, and, and blended finance is basically an example of debt. It can't just all be equity. 
right? And deeper impact, potentially muted returns. Till now, impact investing has been all market returns and therefore only 0.01% of businesses make it through. But there's a lot of businesses that give 10, 15, 20% IRR. What about them? So blended finance can fund all of those. So frankly, that's the future of, uh, of impact investing. And thirdly, private capital. We've got so many charter members and Thai members on this call. And it's really folks like that who, who uh, can give a fillip to this industry. Uh, you know, family offices, H&Is, commercial institutional capital. So we do expect to see a lot more private capital coming in. You see large banks like Goldman Sachs, UBS, et cetera, all of them coming into impact in some way. So we do see a lot more private capital coming in. So these, I would say, are the big three trends, regulation, blended finance, and an influx of more commercial capital. Good. Uh, thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, I think we've sort of run out of time. I've just got a couple of questions here, so I'll jump to them uh, right away. So first question is from Mamta Jain, and uh, she's asking that, hi, Karthik, love the concept of gramophone. Is there a scope for adding a nudge feature on invisible work done by women farmers? Well, what an interesting question. Um, yes, because with, with, with the use of tech, anything is possible. I myself am discovering this and get inspired and amazed by it when I see companies like Gramophone. You know, and of course, it's so hard to explain this in one or two minutes, guys, but you know, um, take it from me that this is not just a, an example of just pushing some information on an app, right? It's really behavioral. They've mapped out every single crop and they're working with the farmer in the 360 degree way. So just to take that point quickly, most households have one phone, either the father owns it or the son owns it. Now the son usually wants to go to the town and not work as a farmer if farming is not remunerative. All of these behavioral aspects are part of the, of the operations of a company. So absolutely uh, incentives and nudges for women farmers, and, and all of those aspects could certainly be built in to something like that. Thank you. Uh, and, the, and the last question is from Sonal Dhabekar. And uh, she's saying we are early stage startup with mosquito control and COVID protection solution range. What are the funding opportunities for early stage? Good question, Sonal. It's a, it's a very specific question. The, 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 there are many funding opportunities. These 40, 50 funds that I spoke about, they span the range from early stage funds to late stage funds, sector specific funds. There's also many networks, uh, angel networks and so forth. So there are a lot of opportunities. Thai itself is one such opportunity. And I, and, and I do want to make, mention one point, if you permit me, Jayesh Pai, which is that the power of something like Thai. And I think all, all of you really need to be commended uh, for doing this. I was just doing my research on this. 1994, I think Thai was founded. So it's, it's, it's been doing this for so many years. In the year 2000, when I was in college, I did an internship for the Rockefeller Foundation on expatriate venture philanthropy. They said, do a study to figure out how Indians can give back money to India. And guess who was the first people who invited us? Uh, Mr. Kanwal Reki, Deshpande, Mr. Deshpande, Sabir Bhatia, and all in, the, in the, one of the first meetings I held in San Francisco in the year 2000 to talk about expatriate venture philanthropy, right? Uh, so I think that it's incredible that the networks uh, and the power that is, resides in Thai and, uh, and that's really where I think most entrepreneurs should start and get their initial capital and their initial mentor. And then once they scale up, all the VC funds like us are there to help you out. Well, great. I think we've run out of time. Uh, we, we have one or, one or two more questions. We'll just take it offline. Karthik, thank you so much for uh, doing this for us today. And we'd love to have bring you back, uh, you know, and, and have more con conversations. And in the meantime, Smita, over to you. Uh, you're on mute, Smita. Yeah, there you no, go. No, yeah. I, thanks, wow, this was an amazing session. Thank you, um, Safina, I think you're uh, I don't see her here, but there you are. Thank you. This was uh, very, very inspiring. Both Sujay and Safina, uh, uh, I mean, just totally applaud you for what you've done. And I think we all, we all here, like, hearing, are just amazed at the that the impact, and 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 the and the scale of impact, and and so that's that's one of the things that we wanted to show people um, that this forum is meant for. And uh, Karthik. Uh, this was an awesome intro to the entire plane of investing, which we, which some, for some of us, it was new. Uh, so it was very good to know about the, you know, 
I know there's a lot to talk about, but at least very quickly, that was a very good one to, to talk about. And I know we, uh, all of us will have lots of questions and um, we didn't have time for questions. We are trying to keep it to an hour uh, because it's a monthly forum for us. Um, we have an email if you can send the questions or we will uh, field the questions from here and send it back to the people as we can. But our, um, our, our um, email is info at, at social entrepreneur SIG. I mean, I think I have to think about that, what exactly it is, I don't remember, but Mohini, we can advertise that later on about what, where, where people can, uh, can send more questions. We'd love to hear from everybody uh, what kind of uh, programming you want us to do. This every month and Karthik as you have a room to bring this kind of, uh, this kind of impact investing and impact social entrepreneurship is the first time we've taken this step. Um, and it's with its global impact and global membership uh, and the footprint that Thai has, this is the, it is one of the best platforms that there is to to get this this kind of enterprises going and and investing investment in it. So thanks everybody for your patience with us and uh, and and staying with us. And hopefully this was as enlightening to you as to all of us. So thank you, thanks to all the participants and all those who attended. Have a good one. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Mohini. Bye-bye. Thank you.